Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Swan Signal Live. I am your host, Sam Callahan. I'm the lead analyst at Swan. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about Pacific Bitcoin. It just happened last week. It was an amazing festival full of speakers, full of workshops and side events and parties. Everyone had a great time. And right now is your best chance to lock in the cheapest tickets for Pacific Bitcoin 2024. And so if you go to pacificbitcoin.com, check out this QR code right here. You can get tickets at the cheapest price you're ever going to get. And we're just going to do it bigger and better next year. So go check out Pacific Bitcoin. Another thing I want to bring up is this episode of Swan Signal is powered by Swan's official mining partner, Marathon. Marathon's primary, primary mission is to enhance the Bitcoin security and decentralized by increasing its hash rate. So you can check them out at Ticker Mara and support Marathon by following their social media profiles. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about payments. Uh, Bitcoin today is primarily used as a store of value. Uh, people buy it, people hold it, and they benefit from its price appreciation due to its scarcity. Uh, but in the future, more and more people will likely start to use it as a medium of exchange. And so how do we get there? How do we get to Bitcoin being used primarily as a store of value? to being used to in exchange for goods and services. And right now I have the perfect guest to talk about this. We have Parker Lewis, the head of business development at ZapRite and a, and a Bitcoin author, one of my favorite people to talk to. So welcome Parker, it's great to have you on Swan Signal Live. Yeah, great to be back Sam um, and, and look forward to the chat today. Yeah, so Parker, I guess uh, you've been up to some new things lately. Uh, you, you know, you used to be head of business development at Unchained, you're still on the board there. You uh, you still work with the Bitcoin Commons, from my understanding. But you started a new venture uh, with Will Cole, um, and I think John. I forgot his last name right now, but um, over at Zapright. So I want to hear more about what you're doing now. Why you decided to make this switch? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you some of the backstory behind uh, behind Zapright. That was founded by John McGill, um, McGill and. Yeah. Um, you know, John had been working in Austin, and so I'd been familiar with John uh, through his time in Austin. Was familiar with Zapright. When I took a step back from Unchained um, just a little bit over a year ago, or I guess under a year ago, so it hasn't been quite a year, was really a step back to work on my book. And I'm still very close with Unchained, still an Unchained client, um, and and still work as you mentioned right down the hall in the Bitcoin Commons, um, along with a number of people from Swan. But um, when I stepped back from um, Unchained, I didn't step back. From Unchained to work on Zapright. Um, and that really wasn't even an inkling in my mind. I was stepping back both to take some personal time as well as to finish my book, um, the Graduate and Suddenly book that um, is coming out eminently kind of like in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the book nice. is done, finalizing things on the cover and logistics around printing, but um, but that, that'll be coming back. And that's really what I stepped back to do. And I also part of what I was missing was, was, was just working on book and writing and kind of in the first month or so after I stepped back to, to work on that, I decided I wanted to write a new piece. And I wrote a piece called Bitcoin is not a hedge. Um, we can talk about that because that was part of what um, is part and parcel to me now working on ZapRite and payments. But when I was working to get set up to accept Bitcoin payments on my blog, um, it wasn't nearly as easy as, as I, as I thought it should be. And while, I'm technical, you know, from a Bitcoin perspective of understanding how to run a node and understanding how to um, everything about Bitcoin keys and securing Bitcoin keys and working in multi-sig. Um, I'm not a software developer and I was working kind of in the, you know, kind of in my primary context as uh, running a blog, running a ghost site, basically. And I want to make it very easy to, to get Bitcoin payments in here. I don't want to, I don't want my job to be being a, a, a technical software developer to figure that out. I want to be able to focus my time and energy on writing and distributing content, not the technical aspects of, um, you know, kind of shoehorning Bitcoin payments into a, the equivalent of a WordPress site. It was, it was a ghost site. So that, that's really what got me started thinking about Bitcoin payments in general. And then fast forward three months, that was towards the end of last year, beginning of 2023. Then in, in March, when we had the, the first of a series of bank failures, that then really kind of accelerated my thinking of like, what would like, 
I was always thinking that at some point in the future, I would, you know, kind of find another project, another infrastructure project to work on. But that really kind of reinforced like, hey, I need to be thinking about and building infrastructure. And the thing that the thought that just kept coming to my mind was what would we build if access to the banking system didn't exist? And that basically, you know, obviously custody is a key part of Bitcoin, but if your ability to quote get Bitcoin is is exclusively tied to a dollar pipe, that itself is a single point of failure. And I think a lot of people that once they figure out why Bitcoin stores value, graduate to the to the idea. And this is kind of a core to, to the the article I wrote a couple of weeks ago called my my pay me in Bitcoin theory is that receiving Bitcoin payments is actually a balance sheet decision. It's the same it's the same economic calculus if you were going to buy Bitcoin via dollars to put Bitcoin on your balance sheet, receiving payments in Bitcoin to have Bitcoin on your balance sheet, it's just a different rail to get to the same economic ends. And so really for me, it was that kind of inception of, I want to receive Bitcoin payments and how I, how easy I think it should be doesn't exist to banks are failing. The fiat system demise is accelerating like we need to accelerate the uh, the investment in Bitcoin payments for that reason. And then having a history with John, uh, the founder of Zapprite and Zapprite already having a strong foundation and feeling like uh, Will and I could augment it and help accelerate it. Um, that's what kind of led me here today. Yeah, the banking collapse really woke people up. I think even people that weren't into Bitcoin realizing that, okay, I could lose access to my money here. And and payments is certainly a big part of why money is important, right? It's the utility function of it, making payments for goods and services to facilitate trade. Um, and so you saw a problem and you were like, I'm going to go out there and build infrastructure to fix it. But you mentioned that a lot of people today view Bitcoin as a hedge, you said, as a hedge against the fiat system. Um, and so why do you think that's particularly not a correct way to think about this and how does that relate to kind of your decision to focus on payments yeah and i, I want to be clear also like on that point too it's like i can see how somebody would hear me say that and say like you're being pedantic or semantic mm -hmm. um and um and i and when i was reading writing the piece bitcoin is not a hedge i really challenged myself on that point i'm like am i just being pedantic because you could say it's it's a great hedge you know, in the sense that um, there's been inflation and over the last three years when the Fed's printed $5 trillion, the, the purchasing power in dollar terms has increased by more than a factor of three, three to four X. So, but when I, when I, when I talk about Bitcoin not being a hedge, it, it's really, it, it's recognizing that there's, there's these two bookends and that if you understand how Bitcoin works and Michael Saylor had this comment soon after he started buying Bitcoin, so you're always like, if you understand how Bitcoin works, there's no way that you only have 1% of your assets in Bitcoin. And so you either exist in a world, in, in, in my kind of thinking about it, that you don't understand why Bitcoin stores value. And if you do not understand why Bitcoin stores value, it's very difficult for Bitcoin to be a hedging instrument. You're more likely to sell Bitcoin at the, at the exact worst time. And therefore, if you did that, if you sold Bitcoin and panicked, because you thought it was a hedge, but you didn't understand it. You sold it when it crashed down to 16,000 last year. Bitcoin was not a hedge. Um, you weren't able to hold it for the long term because you didn't understand it. So if you don't understand Bitcoin, it functionally cannot be a hedge. You, you, you won't be able to toler tolerate the volatility. Yep. But then if you understand why Bitcoin stores value um, and you understand it centers around its fixed supply and that it's money that can't be printed, and if you start to understand how that's actually possible, then you you can very uh, clearly, what, it might not be linear, but you can see the path as to why Bitcoin goes from where it is today as this uh, nascent and volatile store of value to the form of money that's going to be adopted by everyone in the world, why it will be perfectly stable in the future, and why it won't just be something that is bought and sold for dollars, but why it will be the primary currency used to facilitate trade directly. So it's like you, it's very difficult to exist in this in-between state. You either don't understand Bitcoin and because you don't understand it, it can't be a hedge for you, or you see it, you understand it, 
and you understand why it's not a hedge, but why it's actually the solution to inflation, right? There's a lot of things that people talk about as the hedge is like real estate's a hedge because it's inherently scarce and if they print more dollars, rent's going to go up. Bitcoin is not like real estate. It is competing with the dollar as money. And when it replaces the dollar as money in the euro and yen and gold, it will be the primary currency that's that's facilitating trade day to day directly without an intermediary currency in between. So, um, and I think that there is something very distinct to say that Bitcoin is not a hedge to inflation, that it's actually the solution to it. Um, real estate is not the solution to inflation. Um, gold is not the solution to inflation. Stocks are not the solution to inflation. Only Bitcoin, only a money can fix a broken money. Yeah, well said. And um, I think when people understand Bitcoin at a deep level, there's a common phrase that I hear a lot. And it's like, well, Bitcoin has already won. And sometimes I go back and forth because I'm like, I don't want to be like hubristic. I don't I want to always think about, you know, adversarial thinking and how Bitcoin could fail. Uh, but when you think about the technology and the fact that there's only 21 million and if that stays the same, you can kind of argue like Bitcoin kind of has already won as a money. And so you kind of say that and said that in your uh, Bitbot Boom presentation. And I was wondering, like, how would you like, would you say Bitcoin has already won? Do you agree with that statement? So I, I, I'll i say what I believe. And then I say what I think is fair to represent to people on the educational path that I always okay. I always qualified. If I was sitting down in a, in a public audience or a private audience, I would say if Bitcoin can credibly enforce its fixed supply then it will emerge as the global reserve currency almost by definition. But I would caveat it to say that if it cannot credibly enforce its fixed supply, then it won't. And I do that for people to, um, to, to focus them on the, the very binary aspect of it, but also there's a, there's a finite surface area to evaluate and that it centers around the, the credible enforcement of Bitcoin's fixed supply. Now, if you don't have an understanding for how that happens, then you can't credibly have a um, an opinion or a conviction as to whether or not it's possible. Um, and so, I think that that it's it's possible for reasonable people to to disagree as to how um, like finite it is that that can credibly be enforced. I happen to be somebody who looks at the surface area of that and say that there, there's not a technological silver, silver bullet that could cause Bitcoin to, to, to fail. There's not a um, there's not another cryptocurrency that could outcompete it. Um, there's not an EMP. There's not a nuclear blast. Uh, my opinion of it is that, that the, the attack vector is a social one. It's likely a state actor. Um, and it's not a mining attack. It's basically somebody who... With like the U.S. government, if they were to say, you know, if you mine this block, you're going to jail. And if the Bitcoin network was not sufficiently decentralized to, 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 to be resistant to censorship, that would be the first of a, a signal that, that Bitcoin was not uh, sufficiently decentralized to credibly enforce its fixed supply. So it's like we're all adults and we can all, you know, accept that there's chance in the world, right? But, and this is what I talk about in the piece, Bitcoin is not a hedge, that when you start to appreciate that the surface area is finite and you can put your finger on it's like i have to evaluate that question and there's either an answer to it that i come to yes or no i either believe it can be enforced or i believe it can't and most people in the world don't know that that's the question to answer hmm. um and but that once you come to a conclusion yourself that dictates you know whether or not bitcoin has quote one like it clearly is not the global reserve currency today but if that fact is true almost definitionally it will be and that there's also something that's a reality that you couldn't build infrastructure for bitcoin you couldn't devote 100 percent of your time and energy if you didn't think it were true right so yeah. people can go out and like hedge and say like i don't know but what i can say is I personally would not be taking the actions that I'm taking if I didn't believe it to be true. 
if Bitcoin can't enforce that 21 million, I mean, this whole experiment will fall apart really quick, but let's assume that it can. And if Bitcoin, there will only be 21 million, it is the absolute scarce monetary good out there. I think it's maybe hard for people to understand. And you you talk about this really well in your piece, Bitcoin Obsoletes Other Money. I highly recommend people go read that. But why do economies converge on one money and why, why would you think that all merchants one day will focus on Bitcoin? I think people look out in the world, they say, well, there's, there's you know, over hundreds of, of fiat currencies. Why would there only be one dominant form of money like a Bitcoin? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. So maybe it's break down people. Why do economies converge on one money? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. And that was something else that I uh, talked about some of my BitBlock Boom presentation. But um I think it's there, there's when I when I you know kind of go back and talk about the the kind of key binary of if Bitcoin can credibly enforce its fixed supply and there's a keyword that's if and then there's a keyword that's credibly if Bitcoin can credibly enforce its fixed supply then it will emerge as the global reserve currency and there's there's two key economic principles that really in my view have nothing to do with Bitcoin um, that that underlie that entire statement and it's that there is a best form of money like you know a versus b versus c versus d there's an objectivity to the evaluation as to whether one is ultimately better than another and that the the primary anchor of that obviously a lot more complex but the primary anchor point of that is a fixed supply and that that should be more intuitive to people which is that a form of money that can be printed is better than a form of money that can be printed 3%, better than a form of money that can be printed 2%, better than a form of money that can be printed 1%, better than a form of money that can be printed 0.5%. That the, that the form of money that can't be printed at all is better than a form of money that can. Um, and so that's more intuitive. The, the part that you just asked about is the part that's that's less intuitive or least intuitive to people, which is that the world converges on one form of money. And before I try to get into the rabbit hole of why, I, I try to reinforce for people to, um, to what I view are economic facts that exist in the world. One's a macro, the other's a micro. The, the macro is that the world previously converged on one form of money and it was gold. Um, and the question that people have, they don't, don't have to understand why, but they have to ask themselves uh, the question, was it by coincidence? Um, because the world did converge on gold. And while people might not understand gold, they would have heard of the gold standard. And that doesn't mean that 100% of all transactions in the world were affected in gold. Uh, China and India both went on the India uh, on the on the silver standard. Um, and people can make the wrong choice. But it's still the case that the world converged on gold over thousands of years. And so it's why and, and was it by coincidence with the key of it wasn't by coincidence. Then on the micro level, it's 99.9% .9 of all people, and, and, I, and this is where you think about yourself. Every day you wake up and you go to the gas station, you go to the grocery store, and you go to the, the, you know, the movies, you go to the doctor's office, you go play golf, you're paying in, in the same currency. And the reality is that that is true for virtually every last person in business on the face of the earth. Not that they're using dollars, but that they're only using one currency. And the question again is why, and is it by coincidence? So then like, it's not, again, it's not by coincidence, but then when you start to get into the fundamental reasons why, so it's like, why does the world, why do, and, and you can think about it as the world, or you can think about it as, 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 a, as an individual local economy, because the, the fundamental question and answer is the same, but it's like, why does the world converge on one form of money? Why would a local economy converge on one form of money? The answer that I put forward is uh, it's not by coincidence. It's not a collective hallucination. It's, it's not a shared belief system. Money doesn't have value just because we all think it has value. That would be like saying that the doors are valuable because we all just think that doors have value. Um, it's that money solves a problem of trade. Uh, trade is an intersubjective problem. I have to have the form of money that you're willing to accept. And when I had to acquire that form of money, I had to think about what form of money um, people would want to accept. That's the intersubjective problem of it. But the next person who's accepting my form of money is doing the exact same evaluation. What's the next person and the next person? And we're all objectively evaluating different goods in the market, but we're doing it for the purpose of trading with the most people. 
uh, and that it's this reality that consensus and the ability to trade are by definition the problem. That's why local economies, that's why the world converges on one form of money because money is solving a problem of trade. Trade is an intersubjective problem. And when you step back from that and you start to realize, and, and this is some, some of what I talked about in the BitBlock Boom presentation, but this very idea of price, if you start to think about the price of anything, in your in your daily life, the existence of uh, the price uh, of a, a, a gallon of gasoline, a gallon of milk, uh, a ribeye steak, um, a trip to the doctor's office, going to a baseball game, the very concept of price only exists because a massive number of people have converged on one form of money and started to price and denominate their goods and services in a common currency. Like the entire goal is to identify the common good that will allow you to facilitate trade. The output is a price system. Uh, the input is not a price system. The output of convergence on one form of money is the, the broad and readily available um, kind of existence of prices that then allow you to trade. And, 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 and one of the ways that I think about price is when somebody puts a price on a good at a, at a grocery store, you don't actually have to, that's, that's communication. You don't have to ask somebody, you know, how much do I have to trade for this? You've just sent the signal of value. And so when you start to understand that money is, in, uh, is solving the problem of trade, trade is intersubjective, and that the whole point is to reach a consensus so that the most amount of trade can happen, that's when you start to go back kind of to these, these beginning questions of why does the world converge on one form of money um, and kind of getting into the micro of that. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that you know the world converged on the dollar, um, and oh. dollar is the dominant price system today. Well, right, and the, and the well, that's a that's a good point. The dollar emerged from gold, right? The dollar, mm -hmm. so the world converged on gold as a form of money. The dollar was a fractional representation of gold, and then as gold was kind of stripped away from the background of that equation, then the world converged on on the dollar. And mm -hmm. when people think about that, it's like, you know. There's the dollar, euro, yen in terms of the primary cross-border uh, currencies of choice. Uh, the cross-border, and this was as of a few years ago, but just like giving an order of magnitude for people, the cross-border credit of the dollar system is something like $10 trillion. The, the next closest is like the euro where it's between like 500 billion and a trillion, and then the yen's like $200 billion worth. So it's like there's this natural tendency to converge on quote, the best form of money, the dollar at the same time it's failing, you would much rather have the dollar if you were in Lebanon today, you would much rather have the dollar if you were in Venezuela or Argentina. All those economies have dollarized because their fiat currencies were printed and destroyed just far faster than the dollar. But the dollar is going the same way as all of those other currencies. It's just um, kind of, you know, I would say it's more apparent to people that start to see Bitcoin. Uh, and it's happening today. It's just not happening as quickly as you know the Argentine peso or the uh, Lebanese yeah. pound. Yeah, I mean that's a great point. I mean when you see weaker currencies around the world fail, there is convergence in real time to the stronger fiat, which is the dollar. So it's a perfect representation of what you're talking about here, with how economies converge to one money in order to build or create a price system. Um, to facilitate trade, but we know that they manipulate the dollar. And so that throws off trade makes it more inefficient. But right now, let's just, it is the dominant price system. It, it just is. And merchants have these set uh, payment conventions, I would say, in terms of the infrastructure and the users and consumers come in and they pay with dollars and they have credit card systems in place. Um, how do you see it playing out where they start to gradually uh, demand Bitcoin because I think it's been a topic of discussion for a long time in the Bitcoin community. Um, it's a kind of a very small percentage of Bitcoin users today. I would say use Bitcoin, um, you know, for goods and services. It's kind of like heresy to spend your Bitcoin almost right now because they're like, why would you do that? It's so early in its adoption. It's going to appreciate so much. But how do you see like merchants uh, starting to adopt Bitcoin? And why do you think they'll decide to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think in, in, this is kind of core to my point where um, I, I don't, um, 
I'm not somebody, and I think like there's a there's kind of a bad word around the Bitcoin world of like circular economy, yeah. where it's like I'm I think about like with the U.S. economy as an example is hyper specialized. Any any economy that has a good form of money will like that's what money and trade allows trade and specialization, right? Division of labor. Um, if you didn't have money, you would have to kill all the food that you eat in the day and go you know, find your own water, you know, rather than go down the street and find perfectly clean water in a bottle for you, you know, like that, that, that's what money gets you. Um, but so like my, like my interests in this or like why I'm focused on this isn't to like manufacture, you know, circular economies all over the world. It's this recognition that we're at the point in Bitcoin, you're, 14, right? Um, that enough people are starting to understand why Bitcoin stores value, that the logical endpoint of those people who have already figured out why Bitcoin will store value is to say, hey, there's a lot more risk in this system and it's becoming more apparent every day. The world is, is more and more on fire. Um, but and again, and it, it's what got me to this point. It was the bank failures, right? Like, mm. think about like think about a business owner, right? Um, think about all the business owners that worked at Silicon Valley Bank or banked at Silicon Valley Bank. And there's 160 billion dollars worth of deposits. I don't know how much of those were businesses, but there were a lot of businesses that worked with Silicon Valley Bank. And the thing that they were worried about was how do I make payroll on Monday, right? Um, so that problem is inherently a problem of custody, but when you start to think about it, the way that those businesses get paid is also via their bank account. So if Silicon Valley bank goes away, you don't just have the problem that my balance sheet is lost my custody problem. I now don't have a way to communicate to my customers, the ones who can keep me in business right going forward right. and so um so it's basically my view of it is it's the people who have figured out why bitcoin will store value why bitcoin is money even if it doesn't look like it on a tv screen why it is and it will continue to be and why why it will be the standard in the future those people will also logically be the people that say you know what just as i saw the risks of holding dollars four years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, I'm now seeing that I need to diversify my risk away from the rails of that same system because it is the same problem. And so the, the key question is, is like, is that right? Like, is the, is the timing right? Is the number of people who've already crossed over that kind of that, that, uh, that point of no return, right? Who've, who've seen Bitcoin for what it is, see the fiat system for us, are there enough of those people to support a market? And, you know, my perspective on this is the person who owns the business, who's going to say like, hey, if you want my services, you, you need to pay me in Bitcoin. Or if you want to pay me in dollars, you just got to pay me more. That it's not going to be consumers saying like, I want to spend my Bitcoin because it's cool to spend Bitcoin. Because anytime I spend Bitcoin, I can just buy more Bitcoin and spend it. Like I don't have to spend my Bitcoin. If a, but if a business wants to be paid in a form of money and, and don't want to go through the, the, um, the, what I would say, the, the friction of the fiat system, then that's their prerogative, right? Because if they, because like, say I'm, say I'm a merchant and I want to get Bitcoin on my balance sheet, I probably already have it on my balance sheet. If I understand why Bitcoin, like, let's talk about MicroStrategy as an example. MicroStrategy, yeah. they already own Bitcoin, right? So if they do business in all these countries in the world where those currencies are failing, I don't know exactly which countries they operate in, but they do operate internationally. They've got to take a foreign currency risk, right? A weak ass currency. There's going to be probably at least 30 days, probably like 30 to 60 days to get that currency out of the local currency into the fiat, the dollar currency. And then they've got to pay fees to convert the each time. yeah each time right or 
they could basically just get the money out of the local economy if there was a customer there willing to pay them in Bitcoin, right? So it, it actually makes, it, it's more, if, if somebody wants to get Bitcoin on the balance sheet, it's more efficient for them to just accept it as payment. Now, somebody does not come to that perspective if they have not already figured out why they would want to have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And that's why, from my perspective, it's like the, the payment in Bitcoin, it's a singular decision. The only thing that you can control as a business is this is mine. My time is finite. If I am delivering value to my customers and I want to be paid in a form of money that I know is not going to be debased, then it's that's all I can control as a business. Yeah, and that's very, that, yeah. You know, and that if then if a business wants to say that to their customers, and if their customers are Bitcoiners, then they'll be paid in Bitcoin. Um, and and it's just it feels to me like we're at that tipping point. That's like again, people sleep on this shit all the time, right? People, it is easy to be complacent. I have these conversations with people I consider to be good friends and good Bitcoiners. Like, yeah, I'll just get paid in dollars and you know I'll convert it to, to Bitcoin. But there's more risk in that statement than um, that people understand. And we live in this world where like, there's been like probably 15 new cycle crises since the bank failures, at least 15. Most people forgot that two out of the largest four bank failures ever in US history happened in the last six months. Um, and you know when Bear Stearns failed, it took six months for Lehman Brothers to fail, right? Um, the same things that caused those banks to fail, it didn't go away. You know, people have been psyoped into you know um, bank term funding program band aid programs. Yeah, it's kind of the soft it landing. It's like no, yeah. the 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 volatility is bubbling under the surface. There's no avoiding it. The same yeah. things that cause those banks to fail is wreaking havoc and. You're just going to find out about it in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Well, the yeah. rates, yeah, rates keep rising and the FDIC get, just updated their report on the unrealized losses on these banks balance sheets. And they're basically at the exact same levels as when the bank crisis happened. Yeah. Um, but no one's, no one's really talking about those bank no. crises anymore. Right. Like, no. So, um, but, you, but you saw like companies, like you mentioned, companies couldn't make payroll like fast when that started going down. And that same risk is, is present today. It's just like under the surface, like you said. Like all yeah. these companies depend on these banks, these bank accounts to make payroll. And you could see how quickly that could come like undone and just get out of control if another banking crisis came about where these they suddenly can't pay their employees. And right. you, you when you this, this disaster. Like, yeah. Right. And so when you think about that, it that that is an acute balance sheet problem. I've got savings and I can't access it and I need to make payroll. But then it's like, well, wait, that same pipe is how my customers pay me so that I can then have savings on my balance yep. sheet to pay my payroll. So it's like the revenue side is just a, as much of a single point of failure as the saving side. I see. Yeah. And so um, I think that like this idea and like me working on Kind of the the Zaphrite side now, it's like um, it's 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 effectively the same mission, right? Um, but it's saying that like I'm not coming to try to like like compete with the other Bitcoin companies that are working on payments. It's like I think that the time is now to work to work on this, and that if we're successful, we'll be part of the solution to expanding the market a hundred x, thousand x, ten thousand x by by providing tools that make more people realize and putting out content that make more people realize that they should care about these things and that they should take action because the same reason that I might write a book to help someone who doesn't understand Bitcoin, understand Bitcoin. It's like helping Bitcoiners understand, Hey, maybe you shouldn't be as complacent as you are being just accepting fiat. Maybe you should get set up to receive Bitcoin as payment. If you're an independent contractor, if you're an attorney, if you run a small business, whatever it might be, it's like, yeah, no doubt. Like understanding Bitcoin was hard. You know, you had to go down a rabbit hole to do that. You want to get set up with Bitcoin payments. It's not going to be as seamless day one as 
if you're receiving fiat payments. Yeah, but, so there has to be this shift that occurs where people stop just like exchanging like fiat for Bitcoin and they actually start exchanging goods and services for Bitcoin. So there's that shift that can happen. You brought up the frictions of the, the traditional payment system, you know, the foreign exchange risk, there's inflation risk, there's settlement risk, um, there's chargeback risk and fraud risk, uh, all those frictions that exist. But obviously, right now, merchants, like you said, they're complacent. They're like, oh, I'll just accept fiat now. And I think part of that, if we're being honest, is there's still a lot of frictions, like you mentioned, with with adopting Bitcoin payments as well. And so you came into some of those problems yourself with your blog. You mentioned like, how do I just get, you know, invoice people for Bitcoin? So what are some of those frictions that exist? And, and maybe how are you guys building uh, tools at ZapRite to help address some of those problems? Because I'd love to hear just like, if I'm a merchant and I want to accept Bitcoin, why is it so difficult for people? And why do people kind of go, okay, well, I'm not going to deal with this now. I'm just going to take on this risk. Like I'll do that later. Yeah, I, I'd say that um, one, a part of it's unavoidable. A part of it is just a, a mental um, kind of hurdle that you have to overcome. It's like, I'm willing to put in some work to get set up to do something new. Um, but that's also not foreign to small business owners. I think it's um, foreign to a lot of people that work at very big businesses that might not want to do something kind of on the margin that's going to require a lot of work and ca cause a lot of regulatory red tape and, you know, kind of just, but like the closer somebody is to the incentives, the, the more likely they're willing to, to, to put that effort in. That's typically small businesses, individuals and small businesses. Um, but kind of speaking, so, so it's like part is just accepting that that is a reality and that's a reality and just certain amount of pain and, uh, you know, kind of a, a threshold for pain that someone has to be willing to accept to, to do anything to, to better themselves um, or their business. Um, but then in terms of the, the, I'd say, the frictions, and I'll talk about myself, um, that the, the thing that I thought should exist was I didn't want to run a server, but I wanted the Bitcoin to go where I wanted it to go. I basically wanted um, somebody to, to, to run the server for me and to facilitate payments. I, I wanted a hosted service, but I didn't want a new custodian. I have uh, a Swan account. I've got a River account. I've got a Strike account. I've got an Unchained account. I've got a Trezor. I've got a Ledger. I've got a Cold Card. I've got all those things. I don't need a new place to store my money. And when I was, you know, kind of if I was to talk, help somebody articulate it, it was I was wanting to grab a plugin drop in an XPUB uh, or a configuration file and receive on-chain payments to be able to connect a lightning either node or account at, a, at an institution and start receiving lightning payments. I wanted to basically get set up and uh, it be plug and play. Uh, I think in my view, keys are a lot easier than, than web development or running servers. I've, as an example, and I also, um, love BTC pay server, um, have a lot of friends that work on the project and I've run a BTC pay server, my blog today, um, it will be trans over transitioned over to running on Zapri, but it's running a BTC pay server using voltage. Um, hmm. but what I had to do was I had to go over, set up voltage. I then had to configure my BTC pay. I then had to grab an XPUB to drop it into a, a BTC pay and all I want to do is like, I don't, I don't, you know, I was kind of thinking like at Voltage decide I should just be able to give them my XPUB and then I don't need to run the payment process. I have no interest. I'm, uh, you, you, you basically run the server for me. And, and I think there is a difference there too between payment processing and, and that's also where there's a lot of uh, risk in the fiat system and friction in the fiat system. It's like, what ZapRite is not, we're not a payment processor. Um, we're just facilitating payments. And that there's something very different and distinct from risk management around, you know, should I authorize this payment out of this account or not and allow it to go forward for final settlement? And then just if somebody wants to make a Bitcoin payment, how do I help them uh, make that happen and have it be done in a plug and play way? And so I think that most Bitcoin users that are, whether they're capable of holding their own keys or not, um, most people don't have, you know, especially small business owners, they don't have you know, software developers on their team, you know, um, running a server and having uptime on a server is hard. So then what most people end up doing is using um, a hosted service. So 
they're not sovereign over their their Bitcoin node, uh, and they're working with a third party, so they're you know kind of leaking privacy information anyways. And so it's really just making you know putting two or three extra hops in the step, and that if somebody's already dealing with this inherent friction of like I'm having to do more work, that they end up ultimately shutting down. And that what you do by by reducing the barriers, um, cutting out steps, and saying hey you want to receive Bitcoin payments, you can sign up for an account with just your email and you could be set up within five minutes and actually have payments going through your website. That that is what I'm talking about, reducing friction to actually expanding the universe of people that will go through the effort to do it. Um, and, yeah. and then from there, you can build more sophisticated tools and more advanced tooling. But it starts with, but with really kind of recognizing that you're already up against quite a bit at the start and getting someone to the point of success um, and not that, that not having to be either a technical exercise or one that requires, I got to go sign up with three different parties to make this happen. Like, yeah, I'll go ahead and shut down and do this when it's easier in the future. Yeah. Bitcoin. Um, I think zap right is really interesting because essentially it's not custodial, right? I mean, it, if I'm understanding this correctly, and if you're listening, um, you know, if I'm a merchant and I just want to invoice somebody and make them pay in Bitcoin, is that right? Just kind of between them and just kind of connecting wallets, but not actually. There's no custodial feature there or anything like that. They're non-custodial. They just kind of connect yeah. wallets and they run all the servers on the back end. So if I'm a merchant, I don't have to deal with any of the technical overhead or anything like that. Is that how I'm kind of understanding what ZapRite is and how it kind of fits in between there? Yeah, absolutely. Like um the um you know like one example we actually use the, the swan library for the uh for xpubs so like just like if you have a swan account and you have your um your you know you pop, pop in an xpub and then you know you want to auto withdraw uh we use the same logic it's just like bitcoin's not going you know never with zap right and it's just like as somebody comes to your website to make a payment we generate an address from your xpub and then it's paid directly to you know, in I that see. case, if it was a treasure or a cold car, but then we also have, so we basically support single SIG, multi-SIG, non-custodial, custodial. We just aren't the custodian. So as an example, we have an integration with Strike. Um, so if somebody wants to receive payment and they don't want to hold their own keys, they can connect their Strike account. And then when someone goes to, you know, hit a payment uh, API on a website, then an invoice is generated. We ping Strike and show hey, pay this invoice and the money that doesn't route through ZapRite, it routes directly to their strike account. Um, we, you know, we plan to do, and we've been talking to the team at Swan, we'll have a Swan integration, we're talking to the team at River, we hope to have a River integration. Uh, we support unchained vaults. So when 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 Swan is ready on the collaborative Cutsy side to be able to have something similar to, to Unchained's configuration file, we could have payments go directly to um, a, a so Swan vault. agnostic with your custody uh, solution system. Yeah, basically that's it. It's it, it's agnostic to it's like what we're and, and this is really important to what Zapprite's goals are is like we're focused on the, the 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 payments facilitation and then giving businesses the reporting tools and the accounting reconciliation tools to be able to be in a position to um, to reduce the barriers to receive Bitcoin as payment. We are not a custodian, um, and but that's not even saying that a custodian is a bad word. It's that we, where we're focused in facilitating Bitcoin payments, um, it doesn't require us to be in that chain. And so it's like, we want to be ag agnostic to that. It's like, we want to be able to enable people to, to uh, receive Bitcoin payments directly non-custodially, but we also recognize that's not for everybody. Um, and there might be reasons as why businesses want to receive it to a Swan account or Strike account or a River account um, or an Unchained account you know, and, and, and not live in that, that world where they're, where they're on their own. But it's like that, that those problems are being solved, you know, by the swans, rivers, unchanged the world, cash apps of the world, cold cars, treasure ledgers. We're now helping to, to be complementary to that world saying each one of those people who are helping people store their Bitcoin in different ways, they have a subset of customers that now want to receive Bitcoin payments. And we can focus on that specialization and rather than be competitive, say, with a Swan or Unchained on custody and conversion, 
we can focus on the payments and be complimentary and saying, hey, if you're a Swan customer and you want to receive payments to your business, set up a ZapRite account and then Bitcoin goes directly to your Swan account in the future. And if you ever need to convert some of it back to dollars, you can do that at Swan, you know, as an example. Yeah, it reminds, it, it reminds me of, a, you know, in the traditional e-commerce world, a Plaid, you know, if I'm, a, I'm an online company, all my customers are going to have different banks and Plaid just kind of is this interface that kind of allows anybody with any different bank to allow to plug in easily to these uh, companies' websites and pay them, right? And, and um, it just makes sense that you would want to be agnostic because there's going to be Unchained customers, there's going to be Swan customers, there's going to be Stripe customers that walk into any kind of merchant um, and they're going to have to be able to facilitate payments for all of them. And so it makes a lot of sense to me. The one thing that I think about though, is there's right now there's like uh, tax implications for Bitcoin, right? There's uh, there's no what they call a de minimis exemption uh, for for any kind of Bitcoin payments, meaning there's no minimum where it's not a taxable event, and so that could be kind of a hindrance to payments. Do you guys like foresee that something needs to change there? Because I know like Senator Lummis has a bill where it wants to include some de minimis exemption for Bitcoin payments, and that overall these like the current uh, tax regime on Bitcoin could be a hindrance for Bitcoin payments moving forward until that kind of changes. If we might not see like a ton of adoption, what's your views on that whole thing? I, I do think it's like 100% that regulatory structure is a, uh, is a hindrance um, or a source of friction. Um, but it's also a reality that people will do things out of necessity. It's like, Hey, yeah. holding Bitcoin and tolerating Bitcoin's volatility in a portfolio is is a you know is is a pure, appears to be a friction, but then people figure it out. Um, and the reality is that if there's a fundamental reason from the merchant side to want to receive Bitcoin payments, um, that you know there's like you know as an example, there's a strike service where you know you spend dollars and somebody receives Bitcoin, right? And they basically help basically reduce the burden of uh, the tax consequences for the, the quote buyer, um, you know, the person who's, who's paying for something. Um, but, you know, there's also just the reality that like, one, there's many different jurisdictions in the world. Um, you know, one of the beauties of, you know, ZapRite never touching any money, um, not being a money transmitter, uh, or a payment processor, it's like we can offer the service in every country. So one, oh, like, you know, if, if you're in El Salvador, you can use ZapRite. Um, but, you know, so it, it's not to say that like, I mean, the U.S. is a big market, right? Probably most of our customers today are actually in the U.S. And um, it it's just this acceptance that like, there's not going to be a flash cutover where like the U.S. government's going to be like, all right, guys, you know, you're good to go, you know, and everybody just, you know, starts doing this. Like people are already doing this today and they're, you know, hammering their politicians and like asking for change because it's a hindrance to something that's already happening. And if it didn't exist, you know, there'd be more, prob more trade happening in Bitcoin, but the tax policy is not the primary thing preventing Bitcoin payments as what you mentioned before. People saying like, uh, you know, I don't want to sell my Bitcoin because I think it's going to go up uh, and businesses being like, well, there's more friction to getting set up. I'll just receive fiat payments and convert it to Bitcoin on the back end. But those those worlds don't just flip flop overnight. You know, mm -hmm. somebody has to go first. And um, and, you know, again, like and I, I, I talked about this at BitBlock Boom. Um, Jimmy was sitting outside, you know, selling his books. And I, yeah, I know he's selling sell uh, Pacific Bitcoin too. If you ask Jimmy how many people, you know, if given the option to pay him in Bitcoin or dollar side by side, because with Zapparite, you can have a, a Bitcoin payment option and a dollar payment option. And so somebody could pay Bit Jimmy in Bitcoin or somebody could pay him in, in both on chain or Lightning and somebody could pay him in dollars. 85% uh, of his payments in in number were in Bitcoin, right? So it's like mm -hmm. Bitcoiners will get over the mental hurdle. We'll buy it themselves and we'll deal with the tax consequence because from a business's perspective, 
The tax consequence is not. It's it's truthfully, you know, technically there's a small difference um, to receiving Bitcoin payments, but there there substantively isn't. You know, people are not paying taxes in dollars each time they receive a sale. Just like if they're receiving Bitcoin payments, they're not they're not having like tax events every time they're receiving. They're they're taxed on profits, and so you know. Imagine you received hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin payments. It's like, well, imagine you just bought a hundred thousand, and there was a fluctuation in the currency. Like, there's going to be some financial accounting statement impact of the change in currency value. But we live in a world of software. Like, we can tell you how much Bitcoin you got received and what the dollar value of it was, and then you can do all the same management of the change in the currency value from when you received it. You know, it's like, it's really the same problem. And so it's like, okay, well, and now what is my tax number at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year? You know, I go through and I do my filing once, you know, or if I'm, you know, a business, I'm doing it quarterly. So yeah, um, it's, it's really not that much more complicated when people, I think people like get probably caught up in like every single time I receive a payment, I need to figure out my taxes on. It's like, no, it's not the way that, you know, it works yeah. today. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see over time, like as this grows, as merchant, merchant adoption grows and more and more of these merchants use Bitcoin and Lightning, um, even if the tax policies stay the same, how much they save based off like chargeback fees. Because I know that like, payment processors and, and the fees that the, the visas and the MasterCards charge these merchants, it's usually their second highest cost uh, behind labor costs. And now you're talking about significant savings if they use yeah. something like Lightning. I wonder how it would offset over time. Like we don't know that right now, but even if the tax yeah, policy like, stays the same, I mean, they, they might I mean, pull out on top. Like, that's a big source of the friction with chargebacks. You know, when I talk about it, it's like chargebacks, holds, um, you know, like, Imagine you imagine you just have a business where your customers are willing to pay you in Bitcoin and then you're in control, right? Like, yeah. Um, in most cases, if somebody is willing to pay you in Bitcoin, like they're not scamming you, you know. So yeah. um, I think that there is a lot there that um, that when people start to di to dive down these the, the the it's not even a rabbit hole. It's just it's it's really like surface level logic and reason to say like, yeah, there actually is a lot more friction that that meets the direct eye to the fiat system. Um, there's a there's a tangible benefit to be set up with a redundancy to not have the choke point of a single pipe being my dollar bank account uh, as to how if I want my customers to be able to pay me uh, outside of that rail, outside of that fiat rail, that they have a way to do it, um, so that it's it's not this like you know niche thing that somebody's doing for novelty. It's saying, okay, I'm gonna accept that tomorrow if I set this up, 100% of my sales are not gonna be in Bitcoin, but it's gonna start somewhere like one to five percent, uh, and maybe it starts at one percent and goes to two, and then to five, and then to ten someday. But then I'm just you know conditioning my customer base to say this is available. And then my business, to a certain extent, is insulated or weatherized, however you want to think about it, from another major source of fragility uh, that is in that fiat system. And so, uh, yeah. but the chargebacks are a critical one for a lot of merchants that are like, okay, I'm, I'm being like, basically, it's like, well, there's charger holds, it's like, maybe my businesses are not, my business doesn't have nearly the degree of chargebacks as others, but I might be a relatively new business. So my, you know, I might be being dinged and my cash might be being held for 30 to 60 days, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm basically paying for all the costs of the fiat system when I'm sitting here as a Bitcoiner with the knowledge that there's a better way. Yeah. When it comes down to it, it's about risk management. Um, and like you said, they'll start to do it out of necessity and it's about building the infrastructure now for them to make it as easy as possible for these merchants to allow Bitcoin payments. And I think that's what you guys are doing at ZapRite. I want to bring up necessity, though, because, you know, you, you wrote a piece uh, years ago now. I think it was uh, Ender's Game. where you kind of break down 
big big picture macro about the the fiscal situation the debt it's it's a really lengthy piece but it, it's great I, I think it held up really well and it seems like you saw the banking crisis that happened back in april and you're like okay now's the time where this might will become a necessity more and it sounds like i mean parker it sounds like you think that things are going to come to a head here and we look at the inflation picture, we look at the banking crisis, we look at the debt and unsustainable nature of the debt right now. Um, I'd love to just get your like big picture thoughts about what's going on, uh, maybe throwing uh, you know, Bitcoin over the next uh, one to two years, let's say. But like, do you think we're kind of in it right now in terms of the, the end game for, for the fiat system? I mean, it's I know it's a big question. It's just, you look at everything right now and it's just, it's hard to like, be optimistic about the long-term survival, uh, given the debt, given given the inflation we're seeing, the geopolitical uh, developments in recent weeks. Um, how are you feeling about things? Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, it, it start, it's it's starting to feel ever more precarious, um, and it's it's starting to feel ever more precarious in a way where um, it's not. Um, I'd say it's becoming less logical or less probabilistic to say like my default my default position can just be to assume it's low probability that the fiat system doesn't start to fracture in a way that um that me preparing for it um it you know it's like that low probability event like six years ago when i wrote ender's game i, I would have said and i think at the time i probably did say it's like hey this is this is still low probability but it's a higher probability than most people think um, and now where it's feeling like we're at today, um, it's, it's like, it's harder for me to see how they survive another, um, you know, another decade. Um, and I, and, and I, I look at it from the perspective of, um, the bank failures that happened, you know, the, the 5 trillion that they printed, um, you know, in 2020 to 2022, which again was forecastable. One of the big things that I wrote about in uh, Ender's Game, and which remains true this to to today, is that um, that they print money because they have to print money out of necessity. They have to print money out of necessity because the financial system is so leveraged that when they try to take money out of the system, it feeds on itself and and, and inevitably gets to the point of all out collapse. When it becomes apparent that the entire thing is collapsing like it did in March 2020, then they have to come back in and print more money or the credit system that's massively over leveraged literally uh, folds on itself. Um, every bank would be out of business. That same dynamic exists today. It's, this, it's the reason why they're going to have to print more money than they have ever had to before. And it's not um, a possibility. It's an inevitability. Um, people are going to to hit the exits, there's an exogenous shock, can't predict what it's going to be, when it's going to happen, um, but that it will, and it will because of the degree of leverage and the amount of debt that continues to be created. People today are, you know, incessantly focused on the, the fiscal situation and the $2 trillion deficits, not wrong to, to focus on it, but whether it's that or the total system debt and all the insolvent companies that can't exist in a world where they try to refinance their debt at seven or eight percent uh, and those those companies have employees and then there's mass layoffs i can't predict exactly what but it all stems from this idea that massive degree of leverage and then when you're looking at um, food and energy inflation it's like raising interest rates does nothing to make food and energy more abundant those are the two most inelastic things that people need to survive every day um, and so when when I look at the world, and again, like I, I like, I had this feeling in in March. It was like, yes, we do need to be accelerating how we're thinking about building in um, the things that will protect us from the fragility of the fiat system, and that we we need to stop thinking like you know, like part of the thought process is like we might not have ten years, maybe we do have ten years, but we can't wait to the point where it's very clear that there's no return because if we wait that long, we're lost. So we always have to be operating um, more conservatively um, in terms of creating redundancies, creating um, 
you know, certainties and security by having redundancies, redundancy in the second system. Um, and so um, it does feel like combination of the degree at which um, the debt problem is uh, becoming ever more out of control, knowing they're going to have to print more money, knowing that inflation all over the world is squeezing, uh, literally suffocating um, the vast majority of people. Um, not That's not, you know, you know, just the bottom 10% or the bottom 25% is the majority of people, um, that, that the system is, is fracturing. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't think, and then when you layer on top of that, that Bitcoin exists as an option. And these yeah. two systems are dynamically related to each other. It's like an opt out of the fiat system on the margin, every trade, every transaction uh, is an opt out that, um, now in the next 10 years, that's two, that's three happenings, right? Um, that's 10 years of knowledge distributing. The idea that the fiat system could be showing this um, level of fracturing and knowing what's going to be developed in Bitcoin, it's like, you know, I don't know if the fiat system makes it another cycle. You know, like one of the things I talked about at Bitblock Boom was, that and it is not. I don't talk about these things to be either dystopian or, uh, you know, fear mongering in any way, but to, to be a rationalist and say, if there's a one percent prob probability of this, you have to protect against it, right? Like the the negative asymmetry of a hyperinflation event merits that even if it is low probability, it's a much higher probability in my mind than an average person would think, and that's fair. But even if it were a much lower probability, you still have to take measures to protect yourself because the negative asymmetry of the event is so great. The negative asymmetry of a currency collapsing is so great. Um, and yeah. so in, in that world, and the way that I think about it is, it's like, I'm going to act because I know that that's the end point anyways. And it's like, if I think that the timing is now to do something that might accelerate kind of building in a redundancy and a security, then now is not the time because if it becomes readily apparent, you've waited too long. Yeah, I love what you said in your presentation. Noah built the ark before the rain. And so you're building the infrastructures and tools right now uh, to allow merchants to adopt Bitcoin more easily. So I applaud yeah, you guys. I'm but, really excited. Yeah. But, but the, yeah, the thing that made, that made me think about was I had this case study um, of GM in, in Venezuela and that um, the... What if you if you go back and look at the timeline of the, of the Venezuelan Boulevard, um, its first devaluation and then hyperinflation, I think it was um, twenty from twenty thirteen to twenty fourteen, the the Boulevard was devalued about thirty three percent, the official rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the dollar has devalued against real goods and services over the last three years by about thirty three percent. Wow. So right. Like if you start to look not at Paul Krugman's um, me measures of inflation, but yeah. food, energy, the things that people actually need, um, the dollar has lost 33% of its purchasing power against real goods and services from 2020 levels. Uh, Just probably, one one probably, Venezuela devaluation in three right. years. So yeah. the, the the Boulevard versus the dollar went from uh, four to one to, to six to one. Yeah. Right. And I mean, then, and that's and like then, Argentina, you had it in 18% devaluation overnight. You know, right. that's the thing. It's it's happening right. everywhere. Right. It's happening everywhere. But then from that like 2014 period, then within the next year, GM had written off 99% of all their boulevards. Within the next year to two years, they pulled out of, of, of Venezuela. So they, they basically, they could no longer, they were basically importing parts and manufacturing cars manufacturing GM cars in Venezuela. They had to shut down and abandon their, their Venezuelan operations. That was from like 2013 to I think it was 2016. And then if you Google when hyperinflation started in Venezuela, it was the year after GM had to stop their operations and two years after they had written off 99% of their Venezuelan boulevards. So my my point is that's like not to like stoke fear, but to, to be like rational. Right. You know, and saying like, hey, the signs of inflation, it's like when your dollar has lost 33% against food and energy in the last three years, 
and you're sitting there recognizing like, I know why they're going to have to print a shit ton more money. It's like, does that system continue? Like how much longer can that continue to exist when, when people can start to perceive changing of prices? It's like, you know, I could say, Hey, you know, when I was in college, I remember when a beer was a dollar 50, you oh, know, yeah. well now it's $7, but more realistically, I'm going to observe when the beer is $7 and 50 cents, you know, and then $8. People are, getting, people are not noticing it. And I, I also saw menus that they're starting to wipe down prices. Like they'll basically laminate it. Right. Yeah. yeah like, like, people yeah. notice that stuff. Yes. People know? are noticing the changing of prices of staples, like whether it's on a day-to-day -day basis, it's month to month now. And that, that, that like, once that psychology is there, it's very difficult. And, and, and when the economic forces exist in such a way to continue to only force it in one direction, it's like, it's like, yep. you know, prepare, think, uh, prepare for the rain before the rain, not once there's a flood. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, we have something that is being built. I mean, that's why I just get so grateful that this, this technology exists, that there is an alternative system that is growing and being built. Um, I think, I think you brought up two great words, which is, you know, probabilistic and fracturing. And so there, there's increased probability right now that the traditional financial system is at risk of fracturing more over the coming years. And, um, you know, when you think about that, you have to prepare yourself. You have to, I mean, it's just, it's so important. And so when you have that, that's fracturing. And then on the other side, you have Bitcoin, which continues to grow. I mean, you might want to place your bets or at least build some infrastructure uh, to help process payments in the future and think about that stuff now before it's too late. And so I, I totally hear you. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's hard not to feel like you are being a fear monger or scaring, but you really just want people to start thinking about this stuff because you yeah. don't want to see more pain that needs to happen. Um, and you want people to be prepared. And that's, that's what, what, that's what I think. And I don't know if you have any closing statements, but, um, you know, that's yeah, I think it's just like, it's helping people understand too, this, I, this idea that, um, receiving Bitcoin payments is the, it's almost by definition, the same thing as buying Bitcoin. It's just that rather than having a dollar be the intermediary good, you've removed an entire currency system as a source of friction. And it's like, okay. Because I can either receive dollars, then, you know, as a business, wait for those dollars to clear into my bank account and then go buy Bitcoin. Or if I just wanted the Bitcoin all along, by definition, I'm having to take some costs out of my business if I can eliminate a whole other currency as an intermediary. You know, it's like, yes, mm -hmm. there's probably some friction of getting set up with a new service and figuring out how it works. And there's some mental transaction costs around that. But if you actually want the Bitcoin, it's the same economic calculus. And so I think that it's it's helping kind of do two things, bring down the friction and then understand for people that like the, the benefit of it is actually higher. And, you know, as a function of those two sides, reducing friction and helping people see the value, it allows more and more people to be less and less complacent and saying like, yeah, yeah. like I should go ahead and, you know, figure out that for my business and, and I, and I should start caring about it. Cause you know, it, it really is. And it's like, and it's not to, you know, like, it's not a, like a value or shaming of people who don't, it's like, Hey, we, if I go around and talk to Bitcoin about 10 people, I feel good. I was just kind of joked about this at a bit block a few years ago. Where I was like, you should have an eight out of 10 success rate. But realistically, if I sat down with 10 people and I could convince one or two from two of those people, why Bitcoin was important for them, why would it, you know, impact their lives positively and not just like, you know, making more money. Um, that's a really good thing to have invested my time doing, but that's also accepting that maybe I didn't get through to eight of those people, you know, yeah. but the same way, if I'm sitting down and talking to Bitcoin, I'm just saying, okay, you already get why, um, you know, you should hold Bitcoin. Let me help you, you know, on that journey, go to the next step to receive Bitcoin directly as payment. I can promise you once you've done it, it there is something rewarding about it. Um, of, and it's not like I've just, you know, taken the leash, you know, you know, the fiat, you know, shackles off myself. It's like, oh, 
that was kind of cool. Like my customer just paid me directly. Yeah. That, you know, like that, 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 yeah, you're trading that like your good. actual work, your time, your yeah, labor directly yeah. into Bitcoin. And better money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but it's also accepting that when I talk about these ideas and say like, this, like these are the fundamental realities, if eight out of 10 aren't there yet, that's not a, that's not a point of failure. That's like, I've just expanded the market of Bitcoin payments two or three X because I have mm -hmm. now delivered. And my goal is certainly for, to help expand the market for Bitcoin payments by a hundred X, a thousand X and deliver infrastructure to allow people to do it, but also to communicate ideas to people about why now they should be thinking about it and less complacent. But it's a, you know, it's a two sided equation. It's like helping people figure out, yeah, get off the couch, but then also being there with a tool to say, and this is what you can use to, um, you know, help get started when you're ready. Yeah. Well, best of luck with uh, what you guys are building over there. You know, I would just say like being complacent in these times with your wealth as the dollar is being inflated at this rate, um, it's not an option. And so you can't really be complacent anymore. I think you have to educate yourself about this stuff. And, um, you know, I do believe that Bitcoin payments is that next wave. So congratulations on, you know, what you guys are building over there with John and Will. Um, and so Parker, you, you said you have a book coming out. Do you have a title for that yet? Or can you reveal it? Yeah. So it's going to be the same under the same title as my prior works. It's going to be called Graduate Than Suddenly. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So, um, the, the book is done finalizing a few things on the cover. Um, the logistics of printing are pretty much solved. So, um, awesome. literally we could be done any day now. Oh man, I'm looking forward to reading that. That's going to be a great one. And uh, everyone should go follow Parker at, uh, at Parker A. Lewis on X. And um, I'm actually going to be speaking with Parker uh, next week at the Bitcoin Expedition in Jefferson City. Uh, so if you're interested in attending that, if you're going to be in the Midwest, you can go to check out Bitcoin Expedition. Uh, promo code SAM if you want to buy some tickets. And uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to you with the air partner, Parker. And um, thanks so much for coming on Swan Signal. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Look forward to seeing you in Jefferson City. Um, folks can also find us at zapright.com, uh, Z-A-P-R-I-T-E. And then also, if they're interested in my uh, that most recent article that I mentioned, the Pay Me in Bitcoin Theory, they can go to my blog at uh, graduallythensuddenly.xyz. So um, yeah, looking forward to picking this back up in a, in a couple of weeks in, in Missouri. I think it will actually be my first time to, to set foot on uh, Missouri and soil. Um, oh, so wow. I'm looking, looking forward to that. Um, but great. yeah, really appreciate you having me on. Uh, always a pleasure. And uh, see you in person in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we'll throw uh, throw that uh, link to the blog post and uh, to ZapRite in the show notes. And uh, again, thanks so much. All right. See you soon. All right, guys, that was, a, that was an excellent conversation on Bitcoin payments. It's certainly something that I'm thinking about a lot lately in terms of how this adoption of Bitcoin is going to happen from store value to medium exchange to unit of account. And I think that Parker is spot on that the end goal is a Bitcoin price system where everything's kind of priced in Bitcoin and how we get there. It might just happen at the individual level where you can only control what you do personally and you have to demand to be paid in Bitcoin. And that'll become more of an obvious option as fiat currencies continue to lose value over time. I want to bring up Pacific Bitcoin one more time before we go. Uh, Pacific Bitcoin just ended last week and it was a smashing success. A lot of people had fun. Uh, next week is Pacific, uh, next year is Pacific Bitcoin 2024. And right now you can get the early bird ticket specials. This is the cheapest prices you're going to get for buying a ticket for next year. So check it out right here. It's the promo code. Go to PacificBitcoin.com, get those early bird tickets. Next year, it's certainly going to be bigger and better. Each year we improve. I mean, this year, I, I just had a, I'm still like thinking about everything that happened in the week. Um, great speakers. There was a basketball court. We had a, we even had a MMA wrestler wrestling people uh, trying to pin people, which was amazing. That was Ben Askren, another Bitcoiner. So uh, that's the kind of things that you expect at Pacific Bitcoin. So check it out. Pacific Bitcoin Festival 2024. Get your early bird tickets. And thank you so much for listening to Swan Signal. I appreciate you guys so much. Like, subscribe, comment. Let me know how I can improve. Let me know what guests you want me to speak to on here. Um, always a pleasure to talk to you guys and, and bring up important subjects with really smart guests. So thank you so much. And uh, see you next week for another great show.